So a lot of people who have leaky gut, Crohn's disease, or, or any type of uh, any type of gut issue, or they're looking for weight loss, the thing that people are missing is learning about how to move the fluids in our fascial tissue so that absorption is functioning well. Because again, most of us are living with a dried out sponge living at, in our body, which is why you mentioned it earlier. You could just drink a whole bunch of water and all you do is pee more because you're actually taxing your organs because the, the fluids aren't getting transported into the sponge because the sponge is dehydrated. Hey there, I'm Amy Connell. Welcome to Graced Health, the podcast for women who want simple and grace-filled ways to take care of themselves. I'm a certified personal trainer and nutrition coach who wants you to know your eating, movement, and body don't have to be perfect. You just need to be able to do what you're called to do. How familiar are you with connective tissue, also known as fascia? If you listened to season 14, you heard me talk some about it, particularly in episode six, where we talked about how transverse exercises are so helpful to our connective tissue and important for preventing injury. So I really hope that you listen to that episode entitled, Why Did I Tweak My Back While Bringing in the Groceries? Which really, that could be anything, right? Why did I tweak my back while reaching to the back seat or anything like that? But in fact, regarding facial connective tissue, I have been so fascinated by this tissue that in the acknowledgement sections uh, to my three men in my book called Your Worthy Body, I said, being the husband and children of a health geek isn't easy. You hear way more about the fascia than you want. And I know I'm bossy in the gym. All of this is true, by the way. But I haven't had an opportunity to talk with an expert on fascia on this show on the Grace Health Podcast until now. My guest, Sue Hitzman, literally wrote the book on fascia and connective tissue and a New York Times bestselling book, to be exact. Sue is the creator of the Melt Method, a gentle very gentle self care technique that enhances mobility, stability and performance, and is clinically proven to reduce chronic pain while restoring overall well being. She's an internationally recognized neurofascial science and research educate educator, a manual therapist, exercise physiologist and founding member of the fascia research society. She's authored two best selling books and is the owner of longevity fitness an online consumer and professional education business. Now I will tell you if you are a 1.3 or 1.5 speed listener like I am, this is one you may want to take down to that regular speed as Sue brings so much information on our connective tissue and the conversation took an unexpected but fascinating turn when we talked about the connection between your fascia and gut health. And I know you guys are really interested in gut health. Now, before we bring on Sue, I'd like to remind you of my online on-demand class called Be Complete. Be Complete is an acronym for all the things we need to be doing as we get older, but we don't always take the time to do, me included, by the way, and it's all wrapped up in one class. So I did this for me and I did this for you. So that way we can make it all simple. These moves help strengthen your core, your balance, your mini muscles, and focused on the mind-body aspect of our movement. Plus, many of these movements are specifically designed to care for that connective tissue. You can find information in this in the show notes or go to gracedhealth.com slash just the letter B, just not B E, but just B dash complete and learn more. Grab yours before the price goes up. Okay, let's bring on Sue. Sue, welcome to the show. Thank you so much, Amy. So first of all, I've heard it referred different ways. Do you say fascia or fascia? I say fascia, but you okay. can say whatever you want. And what we're talking about is a specific connective tissue that stabilizes everything in the body one way or other. Okay. Well, let's dig right into that because I know there is a lot of different connective tissue in the body. And so talk to us specifically about what fascia is and how that differs from other connective tissue in our body. 
Sure. So, I mean, there are actually a lot of connective tissues in our body. Blood could be considered a connective tissue uh, because there's fiber in blood. Uh, our bones are porous and, and they are also a connective tissue. But what they define as fascia is all of the collagenous soft tissue in the body that includes the tendons, the cartilage, the ligaments, the membranes that collectively supports, protects, and stabilizes every aspect of your body. It's where the collagen is both produced and uh, what stabilizes us is this collagen matrix. And what recent science is really understanding is that this system provides whole body integration and support, not just for your muscles and bones. It's, it does give you joint shock absorption. It keeps your organs tucked back in your belly, but it's also the, the system that supports, protects, and stabilizes every nerve, blood vessel, and cell in your body. So uh, if you're talking about nutrient absorption, you're talking about chemical transportation, uh, any, any way that you could define stability, emotional, chemical, neurological, psychological, emotional. I could relate fascia to all of these things because it is the environment that every other system relies upon to have its space in the body, its autonomy, as well as its connection to everything else. This is a relatively new science, right? Like within the last 20 years, this is kind of well, I mean, we've always known about fascia. Like fascia, if you look at, uh, you know, writings from Vesalius in the 1500s, fascia isn't unknown. It's just that it was considered an inert packing material for so many years. I always imagine anatomists seeing this fascial tissue and going, what is that? And they'll just say, it's just connective tissue. And they would chuck it in the bucket to get to the good stuff. And in that, we didn't really look at fascia as more than just a insulin later and a cushion or a shock absorption system. But we're now understanding fascia because of atomic force microscopy and using these high-powered microscopes, we're now looking at the intricate aspects of fascia and understanding what the cellular matrix is doing, what are the cells of fascia responsible for, and how do they maintain the supportive quality of this connective tissue that they lay down, right? So these fibroblasts are laying down collagen, elastin, hyaluronin, which is that gel-like substance they call ground substance that sort of keeps everything kind of gushy and gel-like so that again there is shock absorption but it but the extracellular matrix when you go down to that microscopic level is how cell-to-cell -cell communication functions so what recent science is really understanding is that daily living causes an issue in our connective tissue that slows down the fluid perfusion uh, within this matrix. And when the fluid flow is not dynamic, that's one of the things that causes people what I call pre-pain signals. Like when you sit for long periods of time and you get up and you feel like you aged 40 years because your joints don't work as well when you get up as they did when you sat down or you wake up in the morning feeling as dried out as a left uh, a sponge left out overnight on your kitchen sink. That stiffness that you feel is so common, but the thing is you get up, you move around, it goes away. So we never think it's a problem. But I always say, if you think of the fluids in fascia like a river, daily living is kind of laying sediment down in our river's flow and where it loves to live is around our joints or our spaces like our neck or low back where fascia is extra durable and supportive. So what we do with, with melt and with many therapies is trying to restore the fluid aspects of fascia to allow the collagen matrix to be more stable so that it functions efficiently. It's, it, it is compelling science. And it's just in the last 25 years, we're using atomic force microscopy. So we, we know more about fascia than we did before, but we always knew it was there. Right, right. Yes. And that's, kind of, that's a better way of saying that. But um, okay, so I want to get into this hydration um, element, because I think that that is really, really fascinating. But one thing that I have been unclear on with regard to fascia and connective tissue is, is there more than one, or is there more than one type with regard to, um, now obviously like there's the, the, the ligaments and tendons and all of that kind of stuff, but I've learned it to be two ways. One is kind of that, just that general connective tissue that goes from the top of your head down to your toes. But then I've also heard about like myofascial. So like I, and I've, I've heard that described as the, um, like the sack, if you envision a sack of potatoes and it's kind of the sack that holds the potatoes. So are there two different types or is it just that it's all intertwined and interwoven throughout your body? 
It's a really great question. So what, what we do with anatomy is we cut pieces up so that we can define things. It kind of gives us the topography or the, or the general geography of where things are, right? So it's all one tissue from skin to bone, head to toe. If you're using a microscope, it's a completely infused system. They call it a biotensegrity system. So it is one in integrated tissue. And because of that, it has uh, you know, I'm, and if you want me later, I can explain what biotensegrity is. But, but in a nutshell, this infused tissue is going, it's interpenetrating everything, your skin, your bones, your nerves, your blood vessels, your organs. There's no separation in it. But when we use a blade, we can then begin to create layers. So under your skin, if you grab your skin and you pull it up, you're pulling up the superficial fascia, which is the fatty layer on the underlying plane of your skin that's completely inseparable of your skin. And then you have these deep fascial layers which are more membranous. And then you have myofascial layers, which are which do allow not only for the compartments of muscles when we do anatomy to cut up each, each piece so that we know where one begins and where one ends, um, but it's also infused into every fascial bundle. So if, a, if a, you know, our quadricep muscle has four muscles, each of those are wrapped in something. But then if you were to open that up, much like a grapefruit, each, each little kernel of the, of the, of the grapefruit ha actually has a, a layer around it. So it's it, collagen is, is intriguing because there's actually over 20 types of collagen in the body that these cells are producing. It's kind of incredible, right? I mean, like why do we need that many types of collagen, but in different areas, we have type one, type two, type three, right? So there's different types of collagen that actually provide different support for different aspects of our body. Like for example, around your around your joints, you have these tendons, these very thick, uh, very band-like pieces of fascia that are bound together to hold the joint into place. But you also have these ligaments that are also very tough, very integrated around bones. And then you have the cartilage, which is the cushions between. But all of them are fascia. Uh, it's just that when we get to those areas where we're dissecting it, we then begin to call them things so that, again, we know where the topography is of where we are in the body. But it's all one system. Okay. Well, that's good to know because that's something I've always been a little bit confused about. So thank you for um, thank you for clarifying that for me. Now let's get into the whole hydration aspect because mm -hmm. I was really surprised to learn from you that even if you drink plenty of water and you have lots of fluids, that really doesn't have a strong connection to the hydration of your fascia and your connective tissue. So tell us some about that um, and how, so if, if drinking water isn't going to hydrate it, then what do we do yeah. to hydrate our, our and, and then also what happens when it's dehydrated? Sure. Like I like to use these words because you, you can kind of gain a sense of hydration, dehydration, right? So I always think of it like a sponge, right? When a sponge is hydrated, if you compress or pull on it, it's malleable. It can move and adapt very easily. And when you take the tension or compression away, it goes back to its ideal shape. But a sponge that, it, and, it, and it also absorbs water very quickly. You put that in water, it actually, mm -hmm. a, a moist sponge will absorb a, a quite, quite a bit more water than a dehydrated one, right? A dehydrated sponge, when you you push or pull on it, it doesn't move or adapt very quickly. And when you take the tension or compression away, it does not go back to its original shape. And if you were to throw it into water, it doesn't absorb water very quickly. And stop and think, what do we do with a dried out sponge to get it to absorb is we cause tension or compression on it. We kind of pump fluid back into the cells. And, the, and in fascia, fascia kind of looks like a a sponge in, a, in and of itself. It has these little nooks and crannies. These they call them multi-microvacular spaces. And in the spaces is where this fluid called interstitial fluids live. So your foods and your hydration actually do play a significant role in the fluid matrix itself. If we're eating bad foods, we're, we're, we're eating lots of sugar, we're eating lots of um, unnecessary carbohydrates. It, it taxes our body because our, our, our gut needs to pull interstitial fluids from the fascial system into the gut to allow things to digest. And then we transport those nutrients back out from our gut into the body and it's transported through this extracellular matrix. So it's not necessarily the volume of water people have wrong. It's consistent water, right? So I always say, if I had, let's say a liter of water, I would be better served sipping every 15 minutes, one 
sip from a liter of water and making it last three hours rather than drinking a liter of water in the morning and then not drinking any water for three hours because your body still has to break down a water molecule and how it gets broken down is in the fascial tissues. So the interstitial fluids of fascia, some of those fluids are being produced by our cells. It's called hyaluronic hyaluronin. Uh, some people would term it hyaluronic acid, but it's really hyaluronin that the, that the cell is producing and collagen and elastin and all of these other ground substances. They're called glycoaminoglycans and proteoglycans, these fancy words to say um, these cells that are like sponges attracting water into the matrix, mixing it up with all of those chemicals and then transporting it through the body. Uh, and it's just that when we sit or we are still for long periods of time, we are causing excessive tension and compression on our tissue. So it's interesting. The very thing that can rehydrate connective tissue, tension and compression, if you, it can, can actually rehydrate the tissue, or if you hold tension or compression for long periods of time, it's the very thing that pulls fluids out of the matrix. And again, where we tend to pull it out the most is in the spaces of the body. That's why you never hear people getting a hamstring replacement as they get older, but they get knee and hip replacements, right? So it's our joints that are impacted by the fascial breakdown that, that occurs through living. Okay. I want to go back to something you said, because I want to make sure I understand this correctly. You said that the gut pulls from the interstitial fluid to have that fluid for your, for your digestion and the gut health and all of that kind of stuff. So does that mean that poor, poorly hydrated connectivity connective tissue will impact your gut health? A hundred percent. Whoa. Okay. So my yes. community is like really interested in gut health. And I think that this is going to be really fascinating to them. Absolutely. Absolutely. So yeah. So, so again, the fascial integrity, the fascia is not just supporting your muscles and bones. It's actually helping your organ to organ communication occur. And again, it's where cellular nutrient is absorbed through our fascial system. And then it's transported to our cells and doesn't just go to the cells. It's got to go from the extracellular matrix, these nutrients, and then our cells absorb them. So absolutely. So a lot of people who have leaky gut, um, Crohn's disease or, or any type of, uh, any type of gut issue, or they're looking for weight loss. The thing that people are missing is learning about how to move the fluids in our fascial tissue so that absorption is functioning well. Because again, most of us are living with a dried out sponge living at, in our body, which is why you mentioned it earlier. You could just drink a whole bunch of water and all you do is pee more. Because you're actually taxing your organs because the, the fluids aren't getting transported into the sponge because the sponge is dehydrated. So if you melt and you do these techniques that are creating gentle tension and compression through the body, it helps with just overall absorption of interstitial fluids from fascia into your lymphatic system. And these two systems are inherently linked. Your lymph system is the most important aspect of your health. It's part of your immune functions. The lymph lives in fascia. So the, so the interstitial fluids are getting driven from the interstitial fluids, uh, uh, the, from fascia getting pulled from these conduits called pre-lymphatic channels into your lymph system. And the lymphatic system is what's pulling junk and toxins and waste and any unnecessary byproducts from the uh, Krebs cycle, the ATP, our, our energy systems out of your body so that you go to the bathroom, you sweat, perspire, spit. All of these things are produced as a waste product of the body. You mentioned melt, melting, and I, I definitely want to get into that. But first, you know, like I mentioned, a lot of my community is women in their 40s and 50s, some a little bit beyond. And talk to us some what's happening um, to our fascia as we age. Yeah, what a buzzkill. I mean, I'm in my I 50s. Know. <laughs> I know. It's like this aging thing stinks. I, would like, yes, I always say, I know I'm going to age. I just want to do it a whole lot later in life. <laughs> so fascia is, when, when fascia stays in, a, in an altered state of hydration, it, it is what creates wrinkles, cellulite, any of the appearances that you see on your skin. But the really bummer about aging is that our cells, as we, as we age, we're actually producing less cells than we are uh, killing in our bodies, right? So there's more breakdown as there is build up. Whereas when we're young, we have an abundance of cell proliferation. And as we get older, our, the telomeres in our, our DNA say, oh, the cell's not so good. And so it doesn't replicate. And as that replication starts to break down, we start aging. But, but a bigger issue is that 
the fibroblasts, the cells that produce collagen are not only producing less collagen as we age, the collagen quality that they're producing is less awesome. <laughs> and so in a, in, a, in a microscope, collagen should kind of look like a crimp, kind of like my hair gets a little crimpy in the summertime. And, and it, when you get older, it looks more flat, like somebody put a flat iron to it. And so the, 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 the crimp-like structure of collagen is what gives it its elastic property, its bounce. So as we get older, we sort of lose that bounce in our skin. You, know, you pull your skin and it doesn't go back to its ideal shape. You're seeing the lack of collagen synthesis. So one thing that's important for women to hear is, you know, you should look into collagen supplements. I think that this is a very beneficial thing. I've been taking collagen supplements for a long time now, and it will help you with your joints. It helps you with your skin, your hair. Um, I just think it's a it it does show a lot of validity to it, um, and most of the collagen that you're going to find are you know they're manufactured the same way. Uh, there's nothing fancy about it. It's just whose packaging do you seem to be attracted to more? I would pick the least expensive and work your way up to some of the high high priced ones. Uh, liquid collagen is often a better collagen source than a powder, but I put collagen in my 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 tea or my coffee in the morning. And uh, I, I also use liquid collagen in my shakes. So I would highly okay. recommend that. Well, that's good. And thank you for just saying, find whatever's cheapest. I mean, that's what a relief that is for people who are like, oh my gosh, now I got to go find the right, <laughs> the right brand for that too. Yeah, yeah. I use all different kinds. I mean, you know, like Vital Protein and I, they are very high in their marketing, but also very expensive. I like um, Great Lakes is one you can find on Amazon. Mm -hmm. Um, I love Kayani products. They have uh, everything that you need. The liquid collagen that they have is fantastic. So there's a lot, of, lots of great companies out there. You just have to do your due diligence. And I always say, be your own placebo effect. Try it. Do you see changes? And if you're convincing yourself something works, okay, now you think that it works. Stop taking it. Did, did the things that you thought were, it was helping remain or not? And if it's not, then it definitely was helping. So. Okay. Yep. All right. Well, that's good. Own lab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You kind of do lab. have to be a science experiment on your own self sometimes are, because we're all different and we're all, you know, we all have a little bit of different chemistry. And so, wow. yeah, I, I totally appreciate that. Okay. So I like to talk about the, um, you know, like rice crispy knees, right? Like you get up, it's, you know, a little snap crackle pop. Um, I have, I mean, I know personally, like for some reason, my right knee likes to likes to be, you know, be a little bit of, a, and it's not hurt. It doesn't whatever, but it's just that like, I can't sneak out of bed in the middle of the night, um, and go to the bathroom because my knees wake up my husband, like <laughs> that kind of thing. But, um, what I have to imagine, um, well, I know that caring for our fascia will help those kind of issues, even if, and this is where I would love your confirmation and then commentary. But, you know, even if you've, you know, maybe you have knee pain and it's popping or back pain or whatever, and you go to an orthopedist, they're like, mm, MRI says it's fine. You know, x-rays say it's fine. I feel like this is where you step in and this is where your fascia your care steps in. So take us yeah. from there. Well, you know, because in an MRI and an x-ray, you're not going to see connective tissue. Right. MRIs are looking, it depending upon what they're looking at, they're, they might look inside of a joint. So they might see the cartilage or the, you know, like the thick membranousy tissues. But the whole global matrix is, is kind of benign in, in those, um, you know, those, uh, those, those types of scans. So, you know, that you can actively participate in compressing or finding very precise tension to fascia and creating a resilience of hydration, pulling fluid flow back into the matrix. And that is what MELT does. The four R's of MELT, the, the third R of MELT is rehydrate. So these compression and lengthening techniques can certainly do it. The, the thing about using a tool for soft tissue mobilization, whether you, know, you want to call it foam rolling or all these other gadgets that are out there, is that a tool is just a tool. Educating yourself on how to utilize the tool, I think, is really what's missing in most people's toolbox and 
the thing about learning how to restore the fluid flow of fascia is such a different thing than exercising that it is like learning a new language. You have to learn different words, different terms, different concepts, whatever it is you believe the body is going to adapt and change. It may or may not be like people are so hell bent on taking a roller and smashing their body as hard as they can, where they feel sensitivity. Like if they press on it, it's going to you know, eradicate the pain. But I always say, if you're in pain in an area, why would you cause pain to get out of pain? It doesn't make any sense, right? Just you trying to will your body into submission is is not a positive, you know, way to work on the body. There's a, there's a lot to it. But the thing about fascia with with our bodies that people really, I think, need to understand is that our sensory motor control, the way that our body sends information to our brain, the way our brain decodes that information and creates a motor response from that sensory input, what's coming in, I have I seen that before, I have, here's the output, is a, is a two-way street, back and forth, the brain to body is always communicating. Fascia is allowing that communication highway to exist, to, to actually function well. So if fascia is in a state of dehydration, specifically around our joints, our brain doesn't really know about muscles. Our brain is going to ignite motor neurons and you know neurons that fire together, wire together, and then you execute movements. But when your brain has a hard time finding your joints, it's kind of like a GPS system. If those coordinates are off, your brain tries to send information down and the messages don't get through, which is why you can bend over and pick up a pencil. And when you get up, your back seizes and you can't, you know, it's like as if you picked up an 800 pound weight, but that was it was your brain couldn't figure out, are you bending over to pick up something light or heavy? And it over recruited muscle activation and there's your spasm. So when it comes to longevity of your mobility, of how you feel, your resilience, Fascia is the foundation of the sensorial system, how you sense the world around you. And, and when your sensory system is sending positive, good information to your brain, your brain is going to execute very precisely uh, movement because it's anticipating how you want to move from previous movement patterns that you've created. Um, and it's just that daily living causes issues where when you sit for long periods of time, you get really good at sitting for long periods of time. But then you want to get up and go take your cycling class at five o'clock and your brain's like, I don't even know what that is. I think you're sitting. So I'm going to kind of contract the muscles like you do when you're sitting still, only now you're sitting and moving. And this is why so many people have that high prevalence toward neck and back pain who exercise is because they're not hydrating the tissue along the spine. The sensory motor control is poor and you get faulty patterning and once your brain is compensating, you're kind of down a dirt road instead of a highway. And, you know, you can only go down a dirt road so many times before you're going to make potholes and you're off to the races for dysfunction and pain. Well, you know, we've been talking a lot on this podcast in previous seasons about kind of the mind-body connection. I mean, I am um, super guilty of spending a lot of my adult life, well, really life up until probably five years ago, um, even as a professional of like, of, of separating separating the body from the neck down. So it's like, okay, what's going on in my head? And then what's going on in my neck down? And it's, it's something that's been really interesting to me to learn about just about the connect, the connection. I mean, like, you know, the mind body connection has been out there for a long time, but really, truly understanding um, that a, a tight hip flexor might be due to being stressed for a really long time, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and so what I'm hearing you say, too, is a critical element of acknowledging that mind body connection and being able to listen and to be able to respond is having hydrated fascia, because otherwise, that is not necessarily we're going to lose the signal somewhere. Yeah, I mean, because we are we're we are a I mean, your fascia is a neuro electrochemical transportation highway. It's like a superconductor. Uh, collagen kind of does act like a superconductor. So frequency and vibration is actually transmitted through us in every possible way. Our electrochemical field, our bioelectrical chemical field, we're, we're kind of picking up energy from other people, right? You know, we call it intuition. Well, you're your fascia is kind of like a, an antenna. And so, you know, if you're picking up something from somebody else, you know, you can kind of know, like if a friend walks into the room and they look super upset, they could just be kind of walking in whatever. And you're like, are you okay? And they'll go, yeah. And you go, 
come on, hug it up. Really? And then, and then they're just bawling, right? But, but right. that's it. So, you know, you, you're touching on something that was a very sensitive spot is, is can our emotions cause physical pain? And the answer is 100% yes. In fact, emotional distress can cause more pain to linger and cause chronic issues far more than a, than a car accident in the recovery of a car accident, right? There's a, there's a very sensitive region of our bodies in the midline, in the central aspects of our body, that when we have a lot of emotional stress, um, and, and listen, everything in life is stress, right? You can't get rid of stress. stress. Life is stressful. The moment you're awake to the moment you go to sleep, your stress regulator is on. Repair happens while we're sleeping primarily. That's where it's dominant. So Stress is always incoming, but how we perceive our stressful environments is really what will make or break the health of our bodies. Okay, so let's get into some application in terms of hydrating it, because I think you've given us some uh, really compelling arguments as to why we need to be taking care of our fascia, why we need to be keeping it hydrated. Let's talk about some real applicable ways that we can do that. I mean, you are, you're the founder of Melt Method. You, I know you have a lot, I mean, you've talked in this conversation about some specific ways and that it's not just necessarily uh, jumping on a foam roller and digging into that one tight spot or the one area. I mean, I know because I've been following you and I've, I've read your books and I've been a member of your program, like you have some real specific ways and, and different techniques of, um, of hydrating that fascia. So can you dig into that some for us? We, sure. I mean, with MELT, we have the, the foundation of MELT, we call the four R's protocol. And the first R of MELT is reconnect. So before you focus on the areas that you have pain, like before you go directly to that area, right? I mean, look, if you sprain your ankle, I get it. You have an acute injury, right? It's going to have inflammation. But the question is, why did you sprain your ankle, right? Like, why couldn't you catch yourself? Why couldn't you readjust your upper body? Maybe there's hip instability. So the thing about pain is that we are very myopic about it. We focus on the symptom. And what MELT does is it gets you in your body to start to identify where the accumulative stress is in the connective tissue system that might be altering the fine balance of your body, which is what is leading to a joint bothering you. So that is really important that people take a moment to really evaluate their body, just like a quality therapist. Nobody's, you go to me, I, I, you came to me as a therapist, I'm not going to just like oh, my knee hurts and I'm just going to start working on your knee. I'm going to evaluate the whole structure of your whole body. I'm going to figure out what really is the problem, not what's your symptom. And the second is rebalancing. Oftentimes, what is causing a lot of people too much stress in the body is a poor breathing pattern. So getting the natural cycle of breath in, breath out back into the body a lot of people have improper breathing patterns. And I know that sounds crazy. Like, how could I improperly breathe, Sue? I mean, you know, I'm breathing all the time. I breathe. I'm breathing. I'm staying alive. I'm breathing alive. I must be doing something <laughs> right. right? <laughs> you know, there's a, there is, but the, what, what happens with a lot of people when they inhale, their body goes up, they... <sighs> And everything sucks in. And when they exhale, every their belly kind of pushes out. And that's actually a reverse breathing pattern. And in a reverse breathing pattern, you cause a lot of distress in what we call in melt the neuro core. So not just your abdominal muscles, but the deep stabilizing mechanisms and reflexes that keep your spine erect when you move and keeps your pelvis stable over a very small base of support being your feet. And when we have poor breathing patterns, psoas, which is a primary communicator between the upper body and lower body can become very dysfunctional. And this can cause our SI joint where the pelvis and the tailbone meet to get completely out of balance. And those nerves that branch out of our sacrum are what innervate our reproductive, our digestive, and our um, excretory systems. So if you have bladder issues, you have gut issues, um, you have any type of digestive constipation, I would be looking at that pelvic stability. So there are techniques in MELT to restore that, that breathing apparatus called the diaphragm and to reactivate the core reflexes and mechanisms. 
and then rehydrate, there are different kinds of compression techniques. We have three compression techniques in milk called gliding, shearing, and rinsing. And what we do is we teach people how to use gliding. Uh, and if anybody just even wants to know if they're hearing this, if you put you know, your fingers on your forearm and you just rub your fingers back and forth, that's gliding. If something's going over the surface of your skin, it's a great way to prepare the superficial sensory nerves and the tissues and the superficial area for compression. A shearing, if you were to grab your forearm and drag the tissue up and down, that's a shear. You're not rubbing your hand up against your forearm. You're pinning the skin and you're kind of dragging it on the underlying plane. That's called the shear. So shearing is actually what stimulates the cells of fascia and starts to lubricate those layers. And rinsing is a global technique, pushing fluids in one direction, kind of like spinning water in a tub. And when you start to charge water and then you take your hand out of the tub, you know that water keeps going in that direction. And that's very similar to the fluids in fascia. When you know which way to organize fluid flow, it helps the dynamics of the whole fascial matrix so that our bodies are absorbing and utilizing the fluid and then junk dumping waste out of our bodies appropriately. And the fourth hour of melt is release, learning how to decompress in traction, the neck or the low back in very subtle, gentle ways or decompressing uh, tension in your hands and feet. This can help with the mechanics of standing upright and moving in an upright posture. We're the only creature on the planet that walks on two feet so elegantly, you know, and also has arms like, you know, we've, we're, we, we have arms and legs, but we're walking erect and we have, uh, have evolved somewhat to this upright posture. But what's a catastrophe for us in this modern day is that we're sitting so much in our day that we're actually altering the development of the human race in our ability to move because we're now very digitally inclined. We can do everything on a computer screen uh, from mm -hmm. go to work to ordering food to seeing a show, like we don't need to leave our house. So I think that this is a real problem because we're not moving enough to utilize and harness our sensory motor and our neurofascial system ap appropriately to keep it in that stable environment. But you're right. We have a very systematic approach in MELT. One of the other hydration techniques is called lengthening techniques, causing tension on fashion in specific myofascial meridians. Um, but the, you know, aside from melt, movement in general is just really important that we get up and move a number of times in a day, not just at the end of the day when we're done with work, but then every 30 to 40 minutes, we at least just stand up from our chair, take some breaths in and out, and then sit back down just to help with circulation and um, the mobilization of the fluids and fascia. It's important. We're, 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 we are the cause of our dysfunctions, not our bodies. <laughs> yeah. And I mean, that's so true. Yeah, that's so true. You know, when you were talking about rebalancing and the poor breathing, um, one of the things that I'm I'm wondering is, you know, particularly as a woman who grew up, you know, in most of her adult life with, you know, body image issues and like sucking your gut, holding your gut and all of this like core engagement has caused, and I'm, I'm sure I do it, like has, but has caused us to tighten all of that up. And then so when we breathe, we're going up and down, like what you're talking about, rather than allowing our stomach to come in and out, because heaven forbid, we look fat. <laughs> yes, it is. Well, you know, I mean, it's funny. I, I remember uh, a friend of mine, you know, who's who's also a personal trainer saying, how do you get your clients to stand upright? I said, I learned, I teach them how to stabilize their spine. She goes, really? I just tell them to lift their chest up, pull their shoulders back, squeeze their ass and walk like they mean it with their abdominals sucked in. And I said, that just sounds exhausting, actually. <laughs> it sounds like you're actually expending even more energy to do something that is autonomic, right? Autonomic aspects of, of movement, we forget that 98% of what happens to us in a day, we aren't even in control of, right? We can't think our way to poop. We can't think our way to digest food. We can't, we don't even have to think to get up out of a chair. We just want to go get something and we get up out of a chair until we have pain. And then we think about everything, right? So mm -hmm. we, like, again, this, this whole idea of function and, and how we move, our, we should not be constantly thinking about sucking or squeezing anything. We should just allow our bodies to move as they will. And if we feel a joint when we walk has pain, 
then we know something is going on in the stability aspects of our body. And again, fascia is the stability system. So you can bet that there's some fascial altercations going around near that joint, but it's also probably in a fascial continuum somewhere on the opposite side of the body, you've got restrictions and these restrictions can cause neurological weakness. It can cause altered sensory motor function, meaning that the, the wrong motor neurons are activated. Um, and a good example is like frozen shoulder. You know, like when you raise your shoulder up, the, the arm should just move. You have frozen shoulder, you shrug your arm, and then your arm lifts up. And it's because your brain can't figure out when you say raise your arm, it's, it's thinking you're asking it to shrug because it shut off the pathway to actually abduct or move the arm away from you. It's crazy that the brain does this, but if the brain feels that there is uh, something that's compromised in a joint, if a joint decreases its joint centralization, if it shifts, that's, that's going to send a signal to the brain that something's off. Right. And so if we get hell bent on focusing on the joint, but we don't realize that the tension compression management of our fascial system is dysfunctional and we don't restore the tension compression management, that the joint is still going to be misaligned no matter what we do. So we got to hydrate the tissue to restore joint centralization. And then with MELT, we have the other two R's of MELT or neurological reintegration and repatterning techniques. These are more akin to an exercise technique, but they are usually done by a hands-on therapist, by a neuromuscular therapist, but you can learn how to do it to yourself and learn how to rewire the neural pathways of stabilization before movement and focus on what's staying stable while you move and you rewire the pathways yourself and you can restore joint centralization by doing these very subtle body techniques. I, I just think in general, my, my understanding, cause I came from the fitness industry, no pain, no gain was what they said. In my late twenties, I got myself into chronic pain. I had tons of stuff in my toolbox and none of it got me out of pain. And it veered me out of fitness and into this healing art of fascial research and rolfing and body work and visceral manipulation, all these other things that I'd never heard about. And what I can tell you is that the body is designed to change. The more you try to keep it the same, the more problems you're going to have, right? Life is a succession of circumstances. It's how we react and respond to those circumstances that is going to make or break our happiness or our sorrow or our suffering. And how we navigate through our life, recognizing that our bodies are designed to change and to challenge our, our ability to change quickly, that's what's going to keep you youthful and resilient. The more you try to go back to the weight that you had or go back to life <laughs> in 2019 before COVID happened, or I want to go back to you know playing sports like I did when I was 20, I'm like, too bad, you're 50, it's not going to happen, get over it, let's move on, right? So I can only be the best version of my cellular self today. And you are a carbon copy of a carbon copy of a carbon copy of a carbon copy of your body. By the time you're 50, you got seven carbon copies going on there. And your, your body is changing. If you resist changing, what we resist persists, you're going to have some trouble. But if you al allow the recognition that my body is adapting, and what I want to do is harness the quality aspects like my muscle mass, my activity level, then that means active participation and I think if you want to get out of pain, you've got to give yourself permission to go into your body and sense what you feel and stop looking outside of yourself for a solution. Stop looking for a doctor who's going to inject you or give you a pill or a personal trainer who is going to, you know, make you do weight training. You know, Amy's only there for you a couple of times a week for two hours of the other hundred hours you've got to deal with. Well, what are you doing in those other hours? And if, if you're not doing something healthy for yourself, then again, you are the dysfunction, not your body. Don't blame your body type. You, you are creating your body type. We have more ability to alter our autonomic regulation than we think. We just need to learn how to tap into it. That's what MALT is about, is just getting into the deeper sub aspects of stability, health, and wellness, which is really the root of who you are. For sure. No, that is so good. And I tell you what, you are speaking my language. So uh, yeah. I actually, I wrote a book that had all of the, it had 22 quote unquote rules of the fitness um, that 
people are, you know, fitness and health that people have heard that we, and, and break them during or break them using exercise science and nutrition science. And so one of them is no pain, no gain, because I'm like, this is something we have heard. And I'm like, no, 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 no. This is, this is your body talking to you. It's a, it's a gift. So I completely agree with all of that. Okay. Well tell us. So last question before I get into the questions that I ask all of my guests, Tell us how melting can be integrated or incorporated into kind of a general lifestyle. I mean, my, my community is women. They're, they're active. They're probably thinking, oh, this is something I want to add and I'm sold, but how in the world can I add something else into my weekly regime? So I'm sure you have an answer for that and I would love to hear it. Yeah. So actually when I developed uh, melt, I created these sequences and each sequence takes about 10 minutes. So if you can commit 10 minutes a day, three times a week, you can get started with melt. And really the place that everybody should start, no matter what your problem is or what you think you want to resolve, if you're looking for improved sleep, improved posture, you want to move better, you want your joints to stop hurting, you want to feel more connected in your body, you want to lose weight, whatever it is, you should start to treat your hands and feet because sensory reception in our hands and feet are so incredibly reliant to the autonomic processes of your body than anything else that's what you want to start with. And there's a mini hand treatment and softball hand and foot treatments that um, take about five to 10 minutes a day. And you can just do them anywhere. And that's the nice thing is that you could do them if you, if you exercise, do them before you exercise, do them as part of your recovery, do them before you go to bed if you have sleep problems. Uh, and then if you learn one of the seven fundamental sequences in the Melt Method book, each one takes 10 minutes. So you could just do one every day uh, so that you're doing something for 10 minutes to restore the fluid system. And I had mentioned this. Fascia is a continuous global matrix. So you don't need to treat every square inch of your body to make a change. You just have to figure out which sequences make the biggest impact globally to your overall stabilization. And that's what the reconnect to the, uh, the, the rest assess to the reassess will teach you is which sequences really make the biggest impact. And then, uh, you know, if you want to invest more time, you know, you can go to meltmethod.com. We have a streaming platform where we've got 10 minute self-care treatments, 20, 30, 45, and 60 minute classes. Um, so it just really depends upon the time commitment. But if you have pain, uh, you know, self-care should be a daily self-care practice, just like you brush your teeth every day to keep your breath clean. You're also doing it to prevent tooth decay. Very similar here. We want to do a little bit of melting every day to move the fluids in our body, to keep them stable. But, you know, it's, uh, it, we're also doing it to maintain the resilience as we age. So I don't know if you saw me looking over. I have your mini ball treatment somewhere. I think Perfect. it's, I think it's an, I thought it was in the right next to me, but it's actually one over. And that is a really great, that's a great ball. And the other thing too, that I want to, so I purchased this, um, I purchased the, the roller, the soft body roller, yeah. the soft body roller. That's what we call it. Um, last December, I think it was like on sale for the holidays or something like mm -hmm. that. And I was like, I don't know, but you keep saying how great it is. So I'll just go ahead and get it. And I got to tell you listeners, if you're tuning in on YouTube, if you're listening in your ears, it is like nothing else. I mean, it is, it is worth every penny. It is just that perfect amount of softness, but with a little bit of compression. Mm -hmm. And I was kind of, I have to admit, Sue, I was a little skeptical, but I love it. And in fact, one of most of my clients, I train over Zoom, but I have one who's in person and she's like, I got to get this thing. I mean, it's just, it's amazing. So well done with that. Mm -hmm. And I, I do highly recommend that roller. And I'm just saying that because I'm saying it. I'm, yeah, you and I don't have any kind of gig going on the side or anything. No, no, no. It is. And it is a very unique thing. You know, I mean, it's more like human compression on a body. And so, you know, even if you don't go and, you know, you, you know, you want, you don't, you don't want to buy another app or anything like that, just go to YouTube, type in melt method, and you'll see dozens of self-care treatments that are there. So they, you know, you can at least try it, um, you know, get the products, try it on YouTube. And if you love it, then get the subscription because I do live classes on the, on there as well. So, you know, you can get yeah. more more out of it when you get your, your person talking to you too. You know, we, we, do, we do live classes that are communicating like this, you know. Totally, yeah. totally. Well, it's a, it, they are really great, great products. Okay. So I've got a couple questions that I ask all my guests. Number one is I love learning about people's tattoos because I have found that often when people choose to put a tattoo on their body for the rest of their life, they have a good story behind it. So I was wondering if you have any tattoos, if you would be willing to share the meaning behind one of them. And if not, if you had to get one, 
what would it be and where would it go? Okay, so I do have one and it is a stained glass iguana. And I I got it when I was 18 years old and I've always had this affinity toward these ancient creatures, these things that looked like they were from the Stone Ages. Um, they look wise, they look mysterious, they're very erotic. Um, but you, you know, you, you kind of want to touch them, but then again, you're a little nervous too. And they have this ability to change shade and color compared to their environment. So they always blend. And I thought that that was a good representation of me as I'm pretty, pretty malleable person. If I were going to get one, um, I would get, I've been toying with the idea because I have this big affinity toward the frequency of trees. So I keep thinking I want to get a tree on the side of my torso that looks like a feminine body with arms that look like DNA and uh, leaves that look like chemicals uh, from the periodic table. <laughs> oh, that's oddly specific, but very interesting. It sounds like me. Anybody that knows me would be like, of course, that's what you want. I do. Nice job. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Um, and tell us real quickly how people can connect with you before my last question. So uh, you can go to meltmethod.com, M-E-L-T method.com. Uh, we're also on Instagram under Melt Method, Facebook under Melt Method, and YouTube under Melt Method. Uh, and I'm, I'm on there all the time, laying some wisdom down, talking about who knows what, but I'm, I'm on on there often. And uh, if you have questions, you can always reach out to me on Instagram. Great. Sounds good. Okay. So what is, and this is something I'm starting to ask all of my, um, my guests, we've, we have covered a lot and you've introduced us to a lot of new words, but what is the one simple thing that you would like um, my listeners to remember about this conversation? That, that if what you want to do is lead an active, healthy, pain-free life, you have the ability to transform your body from the inside out and sipping water frequently and eating water-filled foods should be a part of of that process and try to live in the present moment because nothing happens in the past and your future is made by what's going on right now, not what happened yesterday. So if we can stay in the present moment where everything is bright and joyful, you're, you're going to be happier and find more connection with the people around you, which is what's going to add just love to your life. I think that's most important. Oh yeah. Amen. I love that. Okay. All right, everybody. That is all for today. Go out there and have a great day.